Okay, the final section of this chapter deals with the liver. The first topic is jaundice. Jaundice is yellow discoloration of the skin, uh, the earliest sign of jaundice is scleral icterus, or a yellow discoloration of the sclera of the eyes. Jaundice is due to an increased serum bilirubin, classically greater than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter, and because it's due to an increase in serum bilirubin, we're going to see it when there's disturbances in bilirubin metabolism, as is going to become very clear as we move forward. Here's a picture of a patient with jaundice. Notice the yellow skin. In addition, notice that they have scleral icterus, or a yellow discoloration of the sclera of the eyes. Now, in order to understand the causes of jaundice, you're going to need to understand bilirubin metabolism. Let's remind ourselves that red blood cells live for approximately 120 days. When it's time for the red blood cell to be removed from the blood, it's taken away by the macrophages of the reticuloendothelial system. Of course, the most prominent location of these macrophages would be in the spleen. When the macrophages consume the red blood cell, they consume the hemoglobin as well. The hemoglobin is then broken down into heme plus globin. The globin is simply protein, and so it will be broken down into amino acids, and amino acids will be recycled. The heme, of course, it consists of iron and protoporphyrin. The iron will be recycled, and the protoporphyrin will eventually be converted to unconjugated bilirubin. This, this unconjugated bilirubin will be taken by albumin in the serum and delivered to the liver. When it gets to the liver, the liver will conjugate the bilirubin and eventually dump it into a space called the bile caniculi. And from the bile caniculi, it'll eventually go into the bile ducts and eventually be stored in the gallbladder for eventual use during digestion. Of course, at the appropriate time, bile will then be released into the small bowel to aid in digestion. Now, when bile is released into the duodenum, the intestinal flora take the conjugated bilirubin present within the bile and they convert it to urobilinogen. The urobilinogen then makes the stool brown and is partially resorbed into the blood and then filtered by the kidney, making the urine yellow. With this background in mind, we can now cover some of the causes of jaundice. The first is extravascular hemolysis or ineffective erythropoiesis. In, in extravascular hemolysis, you get excessive destruction of the red blood cells by the reticular endothelial system. And in ineffective erythropoiesis, you get death of red blood cells within the bone marrow due to some ineffective ability to form the red blood cells, for example, which then again will also result in consumption of the red blood cells by the macrophages of the bone marrow. In either case, the idea is that you're going to get excessive production of unconjugated bilirubin. Now, these high levels of unconjugated bilirubin, they're going to overwhelm the conjugating ability of the liver. That's going to result in a high unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, of course, giving the patient jaundice. Just to illustrate this, let's pretend that the reticular endothelial system normally makes 50 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin per minute. And let's pretend that the liver has the ability to conjugate 75 molecules per minute. So normally you wouldn't see a buildup of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. However, if the patient is now producing 100 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin per minute, that's going to overwhelm the liver's ability to conjugate, and so therefore you're going to see excessive unconjugated bilirubin within the blood. And of course, that's what we see in this particular circumstance. Now, this unconjugated bilirubin will eventually be conjugated by the liver because it has no place else to go. Remember that unconjugated bilirubin is not water soluble, so it can't leak out in the urine. It simply just floats around the blood until the liver finally gets a chance to conjugate it. As the liver conjugates all this unconjugated bilirubin, you're now going to get excessive conjugated bilirubin within the bile. And so that's going to increase the concentration of conjugated bilirubin within the bile, increasing the risk for pigmented gallstones. Now, these patients will have very high concentrations of conjugated bilirubin within the bile. When that is released into the duodenum, they're going to get excessive production of urobilinogen. That excessive urobilinogen will also eventually be resorbed into the blood, filtered by the kidney, and then will make the urine dark. So that's an important finding as well. So two important consequences, dark urine and an increased risk for pigmented gallstones. Now, board examiners like you to know that when this urine is dark, it is due to the excessive urine urobilinogen and it's not due to the unconjugated bilirubin because remember that the unconjugated bilirubin is not water soluble and therefore it can't enter into the urine. Examiners will test you on that point. The next disorder that results in jaundice is physiologic jaundice of the newborn. Now, the idea here is that the newborn liver has a relatively low conjugating ability. Recall that the enzyme that performs the conjugation is UGT or uranine glucuronyl transferase. Now, in the newborn liver, the activity of UGT is relatively low, and so the patients can develop an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. Now, let's just illustrate this. We said that the normal, for example, would be 50 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin being produced by the reticular endothelial cells. And let's pretend that the normal liver has the ability to conjugate 75 molecules per minute. And so again, there would be no backup of unconjugated bilirubin in the system. However, if you have an immature liver and the liver is only able to conjugate, for example, 40 per minute, now you're going to get backup of unconjugated bilirubin into the blood, which is then, of course, going to result in increased unconjugated bilirubin. Now, in this particular case, the unconjugated bilirubin will have no place to go. Again, it's fat soluble and it cannot leave and it cannot leak out through the urine. Now, in a newborn, the key complication will be that this unconjugated bilirubin, because it's fat soluble, can actually deposit within the brain, particularly within the basal ganglia, and that can lead to neurologic deficits and death. And this entire sequence is called chronicterus. And so, there's a concern for the development of chronicterus uh, in, in a child that has an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. The treatment, of course, is phototherapy. It's very high yield to note for the purposes of board exams that the, that the phototherapy does not conjugate the bilirubin. It merely makes the unconjugated bilirubin water soluble. And so, by altering the molecule so that it becomes water soluble, it can then leak out in the urine. The next disorder that can give you jaundice is Gilbert syndrome. Now, in Gilbert syndrome, the patients have a genetically low autosomal recessive, mild decrease in UGT conjugating activity. Of course, if the liver can't conjugate, there'll be an increase in unconjugated bilirubin. Now, normally, what happens again is that you, let's say, for example, produce 50 molecules of unconjugated bilirubin per minute. Again, this is an arbitrary number, and your liver normally has the ability to conjugate 75. In these patients, they can only conjugate, for example, 50. And so, for the most part, they don't actually have jaundice. However, were a stress to arise, for example, severe infection, then the patients could develop jaundice. Now, in crickler Jarrett syndrome, you have a more severe decrease in UGT. In fact, there's an almost near absence of UGT. And so, if there's a near absence of UGT, you're going to get very high levels of unconjugated bilirubin. Of course, this is a genetic disorder, so that would be seen in the fetus, and that could result in chronicterus because, of course, the unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble with deposit in the brain. So, crickler Jarrett syndrome is usually fatal. Now, I think the Gilbert syndrome and crickler Jarrett are sort of opposite extremes of a similar problem. Again, in Gilbert, you have mildly low UGT, whereas in crickler Jarrett, it's absent. Now, a funny way that I bear this in mind is sort of crickler Jarrett sounds like a maybe like one of the villains that you would hear about in a Disney movie or something. And so, I think of crickler Jarrett is sort of the, the evil version of this disease, and so therefore, I remember it as uh, as a complete absence, which would produce chronicterus, which would be fatal. But anyway, that's one way to think about it. Dubin Johnson syndrome can lead to jaundice, and this is a deficiency of the bilirubin canicular transport protein. It happens to be autosomal recessive. Let's go back and remind ourselves that the liver hepatocyte takes unconjugated bilirubin and then eventually conjugates it. Now, once it conjugates the bilirubin, the next thing that it will do is to dump it into these bile caniculi, which eventually lead to the bile ducts. However, in order to put it in the bile caniculi, you need the canicular transport protein. So if this canicular transport protein is deficient, conjugated bilirubin will build up within the liver cell and will eventually leak out into the blood, giving you a conjugated bilirubinemia. And so that's exactly what we say here. You get an increase in conjugated bilirubin within the blood. Now, this disorder
gallstones or pancreatic carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma, which is a cancer of the biliary tract epithelium, uh, or parasites or the liver fluke, etc. Each of these things can block the biliary tract, resulting in obstruction. Now, when there's block of the biliary tract, a few important things are going to happen. First of all, whatever's in the bile is going to leak into the blood. So what are some things that are in bile? Conjugated bilirubin is in bile, so that will go up within the blood. In addition, you have bile acids and bile salts within the bile, so these will also leak into the blood, and they will also be able to deposit within the skin, creating pruritus. Finally, there's a lot of cholesterol within the bile, so cholesterol will leak into the blood, giving you hypercholesterolemia and xanthomas as well. Now, the second consequence of obstructive jaundice will be that you won't be able to put bile into the bowel. And so because you can't put bile into the bowel, the patients are going to have pale stool. Uh, and in addition, they're going to get steatorrhea because you don't have bile, so you can't digest fat, and they'll get malabsorption of fat, soluble vitamins. Now, the final thing to note is that the patients are going to have a dark urine. The reason they have a dark urine is because the conjugated bilirubin, which is gone up in this case, is water soluble. So the urine will be dark. However, again, the, the stool will be pale. The final cause of jaundice that I've listed here in the table is viral hepatitis. Viral hepatitis causes inflammation and disruption of the hepatocytes along with the small bile ductules. So therefore, what will happen is that you're going to get an increase in both the conjugated and the unconjugated bilirubin. Of course, the unconjugated because you're damaging the hepatocytes, and the conjugated because you're damaging the small bile ductules. And now in this particular case, the urine will be dark. The reason why it's dark is because you've got conjugated bilirubin. And conjugated bilirubin is water soluble so it will leak out in the urine at the same time it's important to note that the urine urobilinogen will actually be normal or decreased now remember that the urine urobilinogen is a derivative of how much conjugated bilirubin you're actually putting into the duodenum which would then get converted to urine urobilinogen and now in this particular case you're not able to conjugate as much because you damage the hepatocytes and at the same time the conjugated bilirubin is leaking out into the blood so less of it is able to go into the duodenum and so therefore the urine urobilinogen will actually be normal or slightly decreased